So yeah, it's an interesting start to 2018. There was a lot of chatter on Twitter and other social networks about how there was a sort of a lot of patches going into the Linux kernel was what I think started people noticing this, and that perhaps there was a major exploit about to be announced that would affect Linux, perhaps, and actually, as it turns out, Windows, Mac OS, and other operating systems as well. The short of this is, is that people at Google and various other universities, Rambus and various other institutions and so on, have discovered a way that any program can pretty much read data that it's not meant to be reading. That can be anything as simple as reading a value past the end of an array, even though the program is coded to not let you do that, which can then give you access to data that you shouldn't have in your program, to up to the worst case, being able to read kernel memory, which is your operating system's memory, where there's things like passwords and encryption keys stored, to actually reading the whole memory of your computer in the worst case. To make it worse, the really nasty thing about this one is it's not a problem in the software as such, it's an actual problem with the way that modern CPUs are implemented, whether it's AMD, Intel, ARM, and so on. They've all said that in certain circumstances, all their CPUs could be affected. So it's a pretty, a major thing, which is gonna require some rethinking, perhaps, of the way the CPUs are designed. The, the best comment I've seen about this is the US's CERT, Computer Emergency Response Teams, article on this, which I've got open here. The overview says CPU hardware implementations are vulnerable to side channel attacks. These vulnerabilities are referred to as Meltdown and Spectre. And then it says solution, replace CPU hardware. That's the sort of thing we're at. So it's, it's pretty major. Um, so the, the, the short of it is, is that you can now, even though the operating system is saying you can't, even though the program is saying you can't, you can read memory that you shouldn't have access to and then use that to exfiltrate data from the computer system that perhaps you shouldn't have access to. And according to Mozilla and Chrome and things, there are ways that this can be done via JavaScript, say, on a web page. So you could technically, and I don't know if it's been exploited yet, but the, the real danger would be that you could go to a web page and it would copy out all your memory very slowly, we should admit, over the network and people would have access to things. It's not as bad as it sounds. There are things that can be done in software that can patch and sort of mitigate the effects of this and stop it happening. The downside of that is that they can have a significant sort of speed performance hit. Your programs will probably end up running slightly slower and slightly depends on what it's doing, how it's actually interacting with the operating system and so on. But as the cert says, to really fix this, it's going to need to require redesigned CPUs. The big thing here, the very big difference between this and other exploits we've covered, because every exploit seems to be the biggest thing since sliced yeah, bread, yeah. the biggest thing is this the fact that it's hardware, right? Yeah, so this is not something that can be directly patched in sort of with a new version of the software where you can switch from Windows to Linux or Linux to Windows to Mac OS, whatever it is, for EB, FreeBSD, Dragonfly BSD, OpenBSD, whatever your favorite operating system of the month is. This is an attack that is fundamentally in the way that the CPUs have been designed to work and doesn't even require the operating system. It can be done if you can get the code to work, say from a bit of JavaScript on a web page, and there are examples that have been shown to do that. As far as I see in the media, there's Spectra and there's Meltdown, is it? Yeah. Are, are they completely different things then? What, or the, is it just that they affect different devices or how does it work? So they're basically, they're all variants of the same techniques, the way of exploiting the design of a modern CPU to access data that you shouldn't have access to. The best way to think about it is that Spectra describes a sort of family of different techniques for exploiting the way the CPU is designed to access data you perhaps shouldn't have access to. Meltdown is a specific instance of using one of those techniques specifically to access the kernel's memory and from that to be able to get access to any sort of memory inside the computer at that time. So they're all related and they're sort of all working in a similar way. So we'll dive down in a minute and have a look. In the paper that has been just released describing the way the Spectre sort of attacks work, there's some demonstration code which I've got here. Again, it runs the same on Mac, Windows, Linux. You can take the same code, move it on to the different things. It's completely independent of the operating system. This is right down at the CPU level. What we've got is we've got a function which is accessing an array of 16 elements. So we have an array and it's called array1 which has got 16 elements in it, and they are set to be one, two, three, dot, 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 
up to 16. So accessing in this array, and they're laid out in memory, we've talked about that in previous videos. This is then accessed by a variable x, which is used to index that array. But the program says if x is less than 16, access the array. If it isn't, it's not going to access the array. The program has been specifically written in a way so that they won't access values past the end of the array. However, by using the attacks described in what's been termed spectre, then you are able to still get the values. In this case, the string that I've changed from the example to be hello computer file. And so if we compile this up and run it, what we should see, let's just make it slightly bigger, is we should see the message hello computer file pop up and so it's getting the data of various things and we see here hello computer file um, is popping up and if you go and grab the you can grab the code look at the uh, paper and it's sitting there at the back now this isn't anything too spectacular it's one program accessing data with inside its own program space why is that an issue well the interesting thing is that what we've managed to do We've been able to do this by accessing a value that we shouldn't be able to access. This code, this if statement, should stop us being able to access this past the end of this array. Yet, as we can see there, the message hello computer file is appear appearing. And this is a problem because this could actually be done, say, from JavaScript on code that's being downloaded from a web page. And so one web page will be able to, say, pull things out of your web browser that perhaps have been loaded from another web page, say, your bank details or something. So that's one possible way that this could be exploited. So the way that Spectre and Meltdown work is that they take advantage of two features of a modern CPU, the way they're designed, the way they're actually implemented. So we've talked about how they're running our machine code, but underneath that's getting converted into the electronic circuits which execute that and firing them off at the right time. And modern CPUs take advantage of two techniques, one of which is called out of order execution. And basically what this means is that the CPU will reorder the instructions well, technically, it'll reorder the micro ops that the instructions get split up into, but that's going even more detail we need to, to find the best way to execute them to make keep everything going and running at the, the best speed. On top of this, we get what's called speculative evaluation, which basically means that the CPU is going to execute code even if it doesn't need to necessarily do that. The best example, if we go back to the code that we were running here, this program has got a bit of code, and I've written it down here, the bits, and we'll sort of build up on it, which is accessing values from array 1 with an index of x. But before that, we check that array x is less than the size of the array. And if it isn't, this code doesn't get executed. So what does Spectre need to do? Well, Spectre needs to do two things. One, it needs to have this value bit of code execute, even though it shouldn't, to try and get those values from our message out of there. So that's the first thing, it needs to get this bit of code to execute, even though it shouldn't. And two, it needs to get the value returned from that out and pass it so that you can actually extract that value and get that value that it was trying to read. So there's two things that it needs to do, and it can do both of those things by exploiting the way that a modern CPU is designed. Because a modern CPU actually is designed to sometimes execute code even though it doesn't need to. Or Rather, we have a technique which is called speculative evaluation. And what this will say is, OK, I am going to execute this code because there's a very good chance that it might need to be done, but it might not. And if it doesn't, I'll undo what that code did and then execute the code that should be done. So, for example, an example where this might happen in this code is... If we didn't know the value of array one size, we didn't know it was 16, so we hadn't actually got that value, we'd have to go off to memory and get that value. If this had to go off to main memory rather than getting it from a cache, it would take 200 times as long to access it from main memory, so about 100 nanoseconds as opposed to half a nanosecond on a modern, sort of typical modern CPU. So it'll take a, a reasonably long time. And so what the CPU will do is while it's waiting for that value, it'll make a prediction based on what's happened before, based on the way this branch has happened before, about whether it's going to execute this code or not. And so it may well execute this code, even though it doesn't need to, because it thinks it's going to do it. In fact, there's ways that Spectre uses to set that up so that that actually happens. So the modern CPU will execute this anyway and then throw the result away. So how do we get the value out of it? Well, actually, if you look at the code that's being used, it's not just getting the value from this. It's actually then using that value 
to access another array, and it's actually multiplying this by 512. Why is it doing that? Let's assume that this act gets executed as well. When it accesses this memory, it's going to fetch in, again, we're talking about the cache, it's going to fetch in the whole cache line containing that thing into memory and put it into the cache. So that will then get cached. What that means is that the next time it's accessed, that um, value is cached, and so it'll be accessed very quickly as opposed to very slowly, again, about 200 times difference in speed. There's a way you can use the cache as a sort of covert channel to transfer information out based on whether something has been cached or not. And as it turns out, even though the result of this is thrown away, the fact that this then accessed the cache and brought that value into the cache line is not thrown away. So the cache actually has that value in it. And so you can use the speculative evaluation to cause this instruction to get executed and actually get the value from memory. And then you can use the cache as a sort of covert channel to get that value or parts of that value out of this thing where it's actually thrown away and you never actually see it into something that you can then extract. And if you look at the rest of the code, you'll see there are things where it's flushing the cache and timing how long instructions take to run. So it's calling the function and then it's looking at how long instructions take to access to find out which value was cached and so which one is accessed quickly. And that is based on the value that was returned. And so if you can find out which bit of memory was cached, you can effectively use that as a proxy to find out what the value that was returned was, even though the CPU threw that value away. And so Spectre, and Meltdown all rely on the fact that the CPUs will sometimes do work they don't have to. They will speculate and say, well, actually, there's ways you can force that to actually be more likely to happen by setting things up in the right way. And if you read the paper, you can see how that's done. Um, so it uses that to cause it. But normally that would be thrown away. But actually, unfortunately, the way the modern CPUs are designed is that it's possible to set things up so they leave a footprint in the cache about whether they access the value or not. And you can then see what the value was returned. So it's a sort of clever way of extracting the values. And they do it perhaps a bit at a time or a byte at a time and they can actually... What Meltdown does, it does the same thing, but it actually, it sort of manages to get the data out of the kernel address space because of the way the caches are implemented and the way that the sort of protection checks are done. The speculative evaluation can sometimes happen before the protection check happens because of the way the instructions can actually be reordered to make things work as best as possible. So yeah, not good, probably need a new CPU. Just reading between the lines, even though everybody's blown up about Intel at the moment, actually the medium to longer term problem is, is all CPUs. There is a big, at the moment Intel has a problem because Meltdown specifically is, an, is a nasty effect and the mitigations for it will slow down the way computers work significantly in some cases. This technique of Spectre does work on other CPUs as well, the sort of doing these things, AMD, ARM, Intel have all said that in certain circumstances there are ways that they're affected. So I suspect we will see a few more plays on this in the next few years. By using this sort of idea of a superscalar approach, we can actually have multiple instructions, if they're in the right order, they're sort of using different parts of the chips and so on, we can have multiple instructions execute at the same time. And then you can say, well, actually, if we can do that, we can start to actually put, say, two ALU bits in which do the addition and so on. And you can have two add instructions providing they're separate.